Good morning, everyone. Hope you guys are doing well. I hope that yesterday went well at school. You had a good day. Uh, a few reminders. Uh, this is for literature. Your Silver Chalice reading. This is really the last weekend you have to catch up before paper starts. Um, I know it's crazy to think about, but next week we end our book. So I just wanted to give you that heads up. Um, and also let you know that next week will be the last week that we're doing lectures um, for history. Uh, we'll finish by the end of the week on Friday going to the Montgomery Museum of Fine Art. Um, so just as also a reminder, I still need a few parents to volunteer to chaperone. I've got uh, four, I think, or three already. Uh, three or four already, and I could use a few more. So if you would get your parents to email me, I need to have their confirmation by email saying that they'll come. Um, so that would, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, today we're going to pick up with where we left off yesterday and talk a little bit about the Emperor Constantine. So if you remember yesterday we talked about uh, Diocletian. He was the guy who um, was rather violent but came in and redid the entire government and actually stabilized the Roman Empire where it looked like it was heading for a complete disaster for falling apart. Um, he actually stabilized uh, much of what was there and he set up the Tetrarchy where we had four rulers. Uh, we had two Augusti and two Caesars set up in the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire with the two halves. And so today we're going to pick up with um, what happened right after he left and leading up to the emperor named Constantine. And we'll talk about him, like I said today, and we'll also talk about him next week. We'll talk about his uh, role at the time as emperor today. We're mainly going to talk about his rise to power. So, Roman number one, <clears throat> if you get your notes out, by the way, it's called Late Roman Empire, Constantine, Early Life and Rise. Late Roman Empire, Constantine, Early Life and Rise. So, Roman number one is unexpected events. Um, letter A. The new Augusti were Galerius and Constantius. The new Augusti, A-U-G-U-S-T-I, were Galerius, G-A-L-E-R-I-U-S, G-A-L-E-R-I-U-S, Galerius, and Constantius, C-O-N. S T A N T I U S. I'm sorry for all the names. I realize I spelled them yesterday, but I, you may not have those notes in front of you. Let me read it one more time and then spell those names. The new Augusti were Galerius and Constantius. A U G U S T I. Galerius is G A L E R I U S. And Constantius is C O N. S T A N, excuse me, T I U S. Also, keep in mind if I repeat something and say it differently the time, the second time from the third or something like that, just make a little note. I, I apologize if I if I slip up or something. I don't have all of you in front of me to let me know. Um, if I miss a point or something, just make a little note of it, and I'll certainly address it when I get back on Monday. Uh, let it be. Constantius unexpectedly died of a sickness. No, died unexpectedly of a sickness. Constantius died unexpectedly of a sickness. Now, we talked about how um, um, when one of the Augusti died or resigned, the other one had to. Um, and so, so you had the two bottom guys, the Caesars, would rise up to take over as the Augusta. So, uh, if you have over here, if you have one of the Augusta resign, the, uh, this guy has to as well. And then the Caesars rise up and set up themselves new ones. Um, so this is just the second go around. Uh, these are just the very first Augusta to actually rise up. The other one was Diocletian and Maximian, and, and we talked about them yesterday. Um... So we have sort of a problem set up here. The problem is not that he dies. Okay, people die. The, the plan should have been, when Constantius died, uh, that his Caesar takes over to rule. 
Unfortunately, that's not how it worked. Excuse me. Um, Constantius uh, was really popular as a military leader. His men loved him. And he had a son who was very popular as a military leader, too. And we, we mentioned how many times the, um, uh, the, the, the sons um, would, would sort of take over. We talked about this earlier, how sons would take over because, well, people would take over because they had a lot of military backing. You know, this course of start with Marius when he began swearing new recruits uh, loyal to him and not loyal to necessarily Rome. So we see here that instead of Constantius Caesar taking over, we see that, letter C, his army declared his son Constantine to be the next Augustus. His army declared his son Constantine to be the next Augustus. Now what should have happened if Constantine was going to be ready for the role, he should have been made a Caesar, and then later he would have risen to Augustus. Instead, the army said, as a sort of as a group, they said, no, we want a Constantine to take over. We know this isn't the way it should be, but we want him to take over. So already, barely has Diocletian been dead, and already his system has been messed up. His system has been thrown out the window. <laughs> Let me repeat C. His army declared his son Constantine to be the next Augustus. Okay, so if that's what happens to Constantine, Constantius's son, well, we talked about the Augustus yesterday named Maximian. His son thinks, hey, that's not fair. I should be able to be Augustus too. My dad was an Augustus. I should be an Augustus. So we have Maximian's son Maxentius, or Maxentius, as the Romans would have called him, declared himself Augustus. So now we're left with two guys in the position of Augustus, neither of which should be, because neither of them were chosen, like, as a Caesar. Does that make sense? So instead of being chosen for the role like they should have been, they were essentially chosen by their military, chosen by their armies to take over, instead of doing it properly. So let me give you D. It's kind of long. I tried to make it clear. Because of this, this is D, because of this, Maxentius, which is M-A-X-E-N-T-I-U-S, because of this, Maxentius, M-A-X-E-N-T-I-U-S, comma, the son of the former Augustus Maximian, M-A-X-I, M-I-A-N, the son of the former Augustus, Maximian, M-A-X-I-M-I-A-N, comma, declared himself, please excuse me, changing time, declared himself Augustus. Let me give you D again. Because of this, Maxentius, M-A-X-E-N-T-I-U-S, the son of the former Augustus, Maximian, M-A-X-I-M-I-A-N, declared himself Augustus. So, the situation at hand is we have the two new Augusti, the ones that should have risen up. We have the one Augustus that's still in power, We've got the two sons, that is, Constantine and Maxentius. And we have one other very capable general, who is probably going to be a Caesar. That's six people, okay? Things are not looking very good for Diocletian's stable Roman Empire. So, Roman number two is very appropriately called chaos, because that is exactly what is going on. Letter A. There were now up to six people claiming to be Augustus. There were now up to six people claiming to be Augustus. There should have only been two, and those two should have been called Caesars before they became Augustus. There were now up to six people claiming to be Augustus, so it's getting ridiculous. Um, you know, presidential races in our country can tend to get a bit hairy, but at the very end, it's obvious which somebody won. Okay, they count them up, you know, people may agree or disagree, but at the very end of the night, all the news stations, all the websites, 
are all pretty much giving the same piece of information. This person won. Whether it's the 2000 election, 2008 election, 2012 election, there's always a clear winner. Okay? Uh, maybe that's close, or maybe there's disagreement, but overall they're going to come out with one. Well, here, we've got six different people trying to claim the position of Augustus. And how many Augusti should there be? Two. So we have four people that will not get a position. So letter B. Constantine was fighting Maximian for power... I'm sorry, excuse me. Was fighting Maxentius for power in the Western Empire. Constantine was fighting Maxentius for power in the Western Empire. Constantine was fighting Maxentius for power in the Western Empire. Now, the Western Empire would have been where much of Italy, parts of Rome, I'm sorry, parts of Europe, Spain. That would have been the Western. The Eastern Empire would have been Egypt, um, modern day Israel, modern day Turkey, and also bits of Greece. Letter C. Licinius was fighting for power in the Eastern Empire. Let me spell Licinius. L-I-C-I-N-I-U-S. Licinius was fighting for power in the Eastern Empire. Licinius was fighting for power in the Eastern Empire. Licinius was fighting for power in the Eastern Empire. Um, so we, we see here that there are lots of different fights going on, lots of different people vying for power. So we're going we're gonna to zero in on Constantine for a few minutes. Like I said, there are others going on. Um, right now, I want us to focus on what Constantine is doing. So letter D, Constantine was... Sorry, excuse me. Constantine decided to attack Maxentius in Rome even though he had far less troops. Constantine decided to attack Maxentius in Rome, even though he had far less troops. So Constantine is taking a very bold, risky maneuver. He's good, but he may not be that good. He's going to try to take Maxentius in his home city, with less troops, it's not a good idea. It would sort of be like trying to fight the United States in the United States with less troops. There would be no competition. But it was definitely risky, which made his victory miraculous, almost. Now, it could have just been a sheer, he did well, and he caught some good breaks. Or it could have been that, as he believes, Jesus Christ actually gave him a victory. So there's a, there's a story that goes along with this. Uh, that has Constantine riding up a hill, and he's coming to the top crest of this hill, and he looks to the uh, up across the horizon, and he sees in the clouds sort of a, a space in the blue. And in the blue, he sees either one of two things. He sees what he called, he sees Christ's symbol. Now, most of us would probably think, oh, he saw the cross. But it's very possible that that's what he saw. It's also possible that he saw the two initials that begin sort of their version of J.C. Um, in the Greek. And that would be the Chi and the Rho, the two, the two Greek letters that begin Jesus Christ. And so he either saw the cross, or he saw the Cairo, or he saw nothing and he's a big liar. But according to the story, he either saw the Cairo, the cross, and the clouds. And at that point, you know, supposedly, he, he thought to himself, God is going to help me. Jesus is on my side. Now you might ask, how did he know that that was Jesus' letters and all that? He knew all about Christ. His mother, um, her name was Helena. Um, she's actually a saint in the Catholic Church. And she was a strong believer in Christ. And according to different art articles, but uh, primary sources, she prayed earnestly for the salvation of her son Constantine. And so we see in Helena a woman who is very virtuous and who is very patient in praying to the Lord for the salvation of Constantine. And so she, he, 
Constantine would have known exactly who Jesus was and probably would have known the gospel as well. Now, most likely, he was not a believer at this point. Uh, he was not walking up this hill as a Christian. It's, it's possible that he gave his life to Christ at this moment, that this was his salvation experience, and this is when Constantine became a Christian. We will have no way of knowing exactly when he became a Christian. Uh, it's also possible that on his deathbed, as he, hmm, as he lay dying, uh, we know that he asked to be baptized. Um, and so it's very possible that he could have, his conversion could have been at the end of his life instead of at this point in the battle. So we'll never know exactly when Constantine's conversion was. I'm fairly confident uh, from what I've read that Constantine was indeed a believer in Christ, which is exciting. Um, really the first emperor that we have it, we could, that's a possibility of seeing in heaven. So back to back to the battlefield. Constantine is about to take on Maxentius in what is going to be an absolutely epic battle because he's just woefully under under trooped. So letter E on the way to battle, Constantine claims he had a vision of Christ's symbol in the clouds. On the way to battle, Constantine claims he had a vision of Christ's symbol in the clouds claims he had a vision of Christ's symbol in the clouds. There have been various paintings done of this. We will take a look at a few, hopefully next week, um, just of, of, of the symbol in the clouds. Most artists depict the cross. But the reason that I say that it might have been the Cairo is because um, that's what he had painted on his men's shields as they went into battle. Now, if you look on the back, on the bottom of the notes, you see the symbol of the Cairo overlap on each other. It's the X and the P, and they're laid on top of each other. You see you have that nice, beautiful X with the P in the middle. Um, those are the two, that's the Chi and the Rho, and those are the letters that were actually painted onto the shields of all of Constantine's troops as they went into battle. So, letter E one more time. All the way to battle, Constantine claims he had a vision of Christ's symbol in the clouds. Number one, he had his men paint it on their shields. He had his men paint it on their shields. Okay, that's how much he thought that he could go into battle uh, under the banner of Christ, that he had all his men paint the two letters on his sh their shields. Um, number two, his mother Helena was a Christian, and she had been praying for Constantine. So those of you who are in the thick of the silver chalice, um, getting out all images of Helena from your mind. Helena in the silver chalice, and you can probably consider her rather evil. This is a different Helena, and she is considered a very virtuous and saintly woman. Let me give you two again. His mother, Helena, was a Christian, and she had been praying for Constantine. Letter F. Constantine met Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge and soundly defeated him. Constantine met Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, and Milvian is M-I-L-V-I-A-N, M-I-L-V-I-A-N. Constantine met Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge and soundly defeated him. Soundly means just completely. No questions. Absolutely just bam. Put the smack down on it would be a good way of saying it. Um, he met him at the Battle of Milvian Bridge and soundly defeated him. This is a really, really important battle. Not because the victor won anything great, or because it was such an amazing strategy that Constantine used, but because this was what led to him being what is historically the first Roman emperor that was a Christian. The very first Christian Roman emperor. And he is considered THE Christian Roman emperor. He did a lot as emperor to help the church. And we'll talk about all that today. Oh, well, really, we'll get into that next week. But we'll mention a little more of that in just a minute. Okay, so um, Constantine met Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge and soundly defeated him. Letter G. Constantine gave the credit of his victory to Jesus Christ and saw himself as a Christian emperor. 
So Constantine wasn't like, you know, just, oh, well, I saw something and we won. Yay. No, he was very adamant that Jesus Christ gave him victory. That Jesus Christ wanted him to win and gave him that victory. Now, will we ever know that answer, whether that's true or not? No, we will not. Maybe Jesus did give him victory. Maybe Constantine just got lucky and won. Letter G. Constantine gave the credit of his victory to Jesus Christ and saw himself as a Christian emperor. He saw himself as a Christian emperor. This was bold. Christianity had been highly illegal under Diocletian. Yet under Constantine, really not long after at all, not very many years at all, we see here, in your Constantine, not only is it legal, but it's celebrated. It's purported. It's the norm. It's okay. Now, does that mean everybody in Rome converted to Christianity? Absolutely not. Not in any close way. But, but we do see it change. It's both good and bad, of course. And we'll talk about it. Right, let's continue. Roman numeral three. Two rulers. Okay? Constantine is not the only ruler yet. He beat Maxentius, which means he is the emperor of the West. But we still have an emperor in the East that needs to, he needs to work with. So, letter A. Constantine ruled the West. You could put capital W if you want, because it's really West means referring to the Western Empire. Constantine ruled the West, and Licinius ruled the East. Let me give you Licinius. L-I-C-I-N-I-U-S. L-I-C-I-N-I-U-S. N I U S. Constantine ruled in the West, and Licinian, sorry, Licinius ruled in the East. Constantine ruled in the West, and Licinius ruled in the East. Once again, Licinius. L I C I N I U S. Constantine ruled in the West, and Licinius ruled in the East. Letter B. They did not like each other, but they kept a tense peace. They did not like each other, but they kept a tense peace. Now, a tense peace means they, they didn't fight, but it wasn't they weren't on good terms. Um, and the reason was is because Constantine had kind of stolen power, and Lysinius didn't like that, which I can understand. Um, he hadn't earned it, you know? He should have been chosen as a Caesar and moved up that way. Instead, he kind of just took the power. Excuse me. Sorry for yawning. Um, letter A again, one time. Constantine ruled the West, and Licinius ruled in the East. B, they did not like each other, but kept a tense peace. Letter C, here's where it gets interesting. Constantine found out that Licinius was urging his troops to rebel. I'm talking about Constantine's troops. Licinius was, try Licinius was trying to encourage the troops of Constantine to rebel against him. He was trying to cause world war, essentially, in the West. Let us see. Constantine found out that Licinius was urging his troops to rebel. So, of course, that would be like, you know, Mr. Copeland finding out that I was trying to get his students to not do their homework or pay attention to class. Secretly. As, you know, you know, my reason would have been to try to make his class disruptive and not work very well. Well, of course his class wouldn't work well if people weren't doing homework. People weren't paying attention in class. So, I would, Mr. Copeland would be very angry to find out if I was doing that. Of course, I would never do that. So, like, Constantine is furious when he finds out that Licinius is doing this. So, they, they started fighting. Constantine actually gained a little bit more territory. He didn't beat him or kill him or anything, but he did defeat him in battle. Um, so, letter D. Constantine and Licinius fought. Constantine and Licinius fought. And Constantine won and gained some territory. <coughs> Excuse me. Constantine and Licinius fought, and Constantine won and gained some territory. So, once again, he didn't kick him out, he didn't dethrone him, he beat him in a battle, and won some territory for this. So you would think that Licinius would realize, hmm, that was probably a dumb idea, I should probably not stir up trouble with Constantine. 
But oh no, he continues. Continues to stir up trouble. So, uh, letter D. I'm sorry, letter E. Licinius then began persecuting Christians to get back at Constantine. Licinius then began persecuting Christians to get back at Constantine. So we see here, everybody knew that Constantine was a Christian, and so Licinius decides, hmm, I'm going to persecute Christians in my side of the empire. That'll show them. Well, that's like me saying that, hey, I'm an Auburn fan. If you're an Alabama fan, then you've got to sit on the floor. And you have to write your notes with a crayon, make them hard to write. And you have to turn in 16 sentences for homework instead of 8. That's just not fair at all. I'm trying to get back at, at all Alabama fans, and I'm just making their lives hard. Okay, I'm making their lives miserable. So Licinius was doing that to the Christians. And, and, uh, and Constantine, they, everybody knew that Constantine was a Christian. And so he was essentially picking at others of the same religion in order to get at him. Not kind, not nice. So Constantine was like, you know what, buddy, we're done. I'm going to now do as much as I can to completely get rid of you. Um, let me repeat E and then I'll say F. E again, Licinius then began persecuting Christians to get back at Constantine. Or F, Constantine began a massive campaign to remove Licinius. Meaning, he decided he was going to get all the troops he could and raise as much support as possible and launch a campaign attack on Licinius. Constantine began a massive campaign to remove Licinius. He pretty much said, oh, it's on. You're going down. And Licinius is going to go down. Constantine began a massive campaign to remove Licinius. Letter G, he defeated him in battle, imprisoned him, and he was later executed. Interestingly, he was not executed by Constantine, but he was later killed. Letter G, he defeated him in battle, imprisoned him, and he was later executed. He defeated him in battle, imprisoned him, and he was later executed. He defeated him in battle, imprisoned him, and he was later executed. Also, I want to point out the Cairo symbols at the bottom of your doc, you know, that you're seeing right now in front of you. And it's, it has the Alpha and the Omega symbol on there, too. Um, Constantine added that a lot. That wasn't originally on the shields. The shields just would have had the P and the X on them. Um, and, of course, he carried that symbol on his shields for the rest of his time as leader. Um, you could do a Google search, Constantine Shields, or Cairo Shields, and then you get a picture of what the shields probably would have looked like. Alright, letter H, final point. Constantine was now the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Constantine was now the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Remember, Diocletian, his whole goal when he set up the Tetrarchy was to make it so that one person didn't have too much power. And it didn't take long before all of Diocletian's government fell apart and one person had all the power. So, Constantine was now the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. He was it. Okay, He was the one calling the shots. He was running the show. So, tomorrow we're going to look at how Constantine changed things up. Remember, the first thing that he needs to do, really, is he needs to officially legalize Christianity. Because remember, Diocletian had made all those laws against the Christians. So, tomorrow we're going to look at his legacy. I'm sorry, not tomorrow. I keep saying tomorrow. Um, next week, we're going to look at his legacy, um, some of the things he did, the sort of official nature of, con of, of Christianity in the Roman Empire, and then a little bit of Constantine's legacy. So, we are near the end. Uh, I believe we have... Two more lectures. I think that's it. One Constantine lecture, and then an early Christianity lecture, and two PowerPoints, and then we're done. So uh, next week should be a, a kind of a lightish week. We have a couple lectures. Um, we will have a day where we prepare. We'll have a PowerPoint day. We'll have a day where we prepare for a field trip. We'll look at the art. We'll study it a little bit. There's actually an assignment that goes along with this field trip, so you actually need to make sure that you, know, you come. And obviously, uh, a few of you have, have talked to have, you know, things already, you're already going to be gone. I knew that ahead of time. Uh, but also, you'll have to do it's just a real small write up. It's a minor grade for each class. It's sort of a response what you thought about the museum, what you thought about the art. 
Um, and then, of course, next Friday is our field trip. We'll leave in the morning. I think we'll get there around 10, 15. Um, it was just enough time to have about an hour and a half to two hours in the museum. And then, hopefully, a nice little 30, 45-minute period outside with put a frisbee and football and, and eat some lunch. Uh, so I did send an email home to your parents. You are allowed to wear non-uniform, but you have to look nice. You can wear dressy jeans, that's fine, um, or a dress or a skirt or any of that kind of stuff, but I put all the details in the email. So please make sure that you consult those details um, before you get dressed that morning. Uh, I think that's it. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend, and I hope you enjoy it and it goes well. And I will look forward to seeing all of you Monday morning. Thank you, guys.